I'm Dr. Fakir Obali and this is bone and joint infections in adults. Bone and joint infections are a group of infections that affect various bones as well as joints and occasionally if there is a hardware in place of a joint. These infections are generally complicated and often require hospitalization as well as long-term antibiotics, sometimes even li lifetime antibiotic therapy to suppress the infection. Surgical interventions are key in source management. Nowadays, prosthetic joint replacement is used frequently to alleviate pain and of course to improve mobility. Unfortunately, these prosthetic devices can get infected, which can lead to significant morbidity. Prosthetic joint infections are often difficult to treat because the offending bacteria, often Staphylococcus species, form biofilm. Biofilm is essentially a polymeric matrix that allows single cell bacteria to behave like multicellular organisms within the complex communities that they form within the biofilm. Inside the biofilm, there, these bacteria are protected from the host immune cells as well as antibiotics because most antibiotics cannot penetrate the biofilm. A big exception is rifampin, which I'll explain shortly. The primary reason for the protection inside the biofilm is essentially the fact that there is no blood microcirculation inside the biofilm in order to deliver antibiotics and host defense cells. In addition to Staphylococcus species, Pseudomonas is also very capable of forming biofilms. There are several steps in the life cycle of a biofilm. Planktonic cells are essentially the bacteria that flow in the environment and this environment could be the host, for example, the blood. The first step is for these bacteria to attach to a foreign object, oftentimes foreign hardware in the host. They can also do this occasionally with bone. The second step is irreversible attachment to the object by losing their flagella and producing biofilm matrix components. The third step involves maturation of cell clusters, which become several cells thick embedded in the extracellular polymeric substance matrix. And then once the biofilm is fully mature, it provides this environment for these bacteria to grow where they are protected from antibiotics as well as they have protection from um, the host immune cells. And the final step is the dispersion process where these bacteria get released from biofilm, they regain their flagella, and they can continue to go back into the environment and infect other cells in the host. Osteomyelitis is a progressive infection that involves inflammation as well as bone destruction and new bone formation. It is generally classified into hematogenous osteomyelitis as well as contiguous osteomyelitis. Hematogenous osteomyelitis, which is often monomicrobial, it is more common in pediatrics. So 85% of the cases occur in pediatric patients. Hematogenous essentially means that the source of bac uh, ba bacteria is from uh, blood. So bacteremia leading to osteomyelitis. In adults, this could be due to injection drug use, central venous catheter. It usually affects the vertebra, which we refer to as vertebral osteomyelitis. For contiguous osteomyelitis, which is usually polymicrobial, it is either secondary to direct inoculation, often after trauma, surgery, or prosthetic implant, or it could be secondary to vascular insufficiency, especially spreads from surrounding soft tissue or ulcers to the bone. This is common in skin and soft tissue infection, especially in diabetic foot infection. Let's take a look at reliable resources. IDSA has several guidelines that are useful for osteomyelitis. The 2011 MRSA guidelines has a section dedicated to bone and joint infection specifically due to MRSA, so there are recommendations for that. There is also a 2013 IDSA prosthetic joint infection 
as well as a 2015 IDSA guideline for native vertebral osteomyelitis. And native basically means that uh, the vertebra are the natural bones. There is no prosthetic devices involved. And lastly, uh, because uh, osteomyelitis often involves long-term uh, antibiotics, there are recommendation guidelines from 2018 from IDSA for outpatient parenteral antimicrobial therapy, or OPAT for short. And of course, there is a IDSA guideline under development for bone and joint infections. The first learning objective is, given a patient case, differentiate between various bone and joint infections. Osteomyelitis is an infection involving any bone in the body or bone marrow. Osteomyelitis of the vertebra is specifically called vertebral osteomyelitis. Infectious arthritis is an infection of native joints that can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, or parasites. Septic arthritis or bacterial arthritis are specifically bacterial infection of a native joint. And lastly, prosthetic joint infection is the infection of prosthetic joint and its diagnosis depends on presence of a sinus tract that communicates with the prosthesis as well as the presence of acute in inflammation. And at least two intraoperative cultures or combination of preoperative aspiration and intraoperative cultures that yield the same organism. Now, if instead of two cultures, only one culture grows uh, an organism, but it is a virulent microorganism such as Staph aureus that also constitute diagnosis of prosthetic joint infection. By aspiration, I'm referring to uh, basically um, when uh, we draw fluids from the joint, so synovial fluid uh, aspiration. We will focus on native vertebral osteomyelitis and prosthetic joint infection. Let's take a look at the clinical features. For native vertebral osteomyelitis or NVO, there will often be back pain, tenderness of the spine, fever, as well as uh, neurologic impairments because this involves uh, the inflammation of the spinal cord. Prosthetic joint infection, of course, involves joint pain and joint effusion, as well as fever, erythema, and warmth at implant site. For both of these, imaging is key. MRI is the most common one, but we can also use uh, some other types of imaging. Now, when it comes to testing, there are non-specific biomarkers for inflammation specifically. So the most common one are uh, ESR and CRP, so C-reactive pro protein and erythrocyte uh, sedimentation rate. Now, you will see that CRP will increase and decrease uh, faster than ESR, so ESR often lags behind CRP, but both of them are pretty sens sensitive, and of course, the white blood cell will also be increased. Now, keep in mind that CRP is elevated after surgery and returns to normal within weeks, therefore, serial post-operative measurements are more informative than a single value. And for prosthetic joint infection specifically, diagnostic Arthrocentesis is very helpful, and this is where we get uh, synovial fluid analysis. Blood cultures are important for both of these infections, as well as baseline ESR and CRP, and imaging with uh, MRI or alternative scan. For NVO specifically, CT-guided drainage of abscess is very important for source control. Synovial fluid analysis can be used to distinguish between septic arthritis, which is infectious, to distinguish that from non-infectious inflammatory arthritis, often due to gout. And the way you can distinguish between septic arthritis and uh, inflammatory uh, non-infectious causes such as gout is that, for example, uh, when you get the culture of the synovial fluid, uh, obviously nothing uh, will be growing uh, in a non-infectious cause, but it will often be positive. Uh, for example, gram stain will show something uh, preliminary for uh, septic arthritis. Uh, another thing you can look at is glucose. So you can see that the glucose uh, levels in the synovial fluid is often greater than 25 milligram. But because if there are bacteria growing in it, they will be using the glucose as food in order to grow. The glucose levels will be low if there is an infectious cause for the, ar uh, for the arthritis. Another thing you can look at is the PMNs or SEGS, 
you know, in a, normally there should be less than 25% uh, SEGS in, uh, in the synovial fluid. Uh, in an inflammatory process, there will be greater than 50%, but if it's due to infectious causes, it's often more than 75% of the white uh, blood cells in the synovial fluid. And of course, uh, you will remember from week one that, uh, you know, neutrophils uh, basically uh, for the most part are uh, SEGS, another word for it are uh, PMN or polys. Uh, and then the so these are the mature neutrophils and the immature neutrophils are called uh, band cells. So the number of mature uh, neutrophils will actually go above 75% of white blood cells in the synovial fluid.